pack. I'm with you until four o'clock this afternoon. Thank you to John Moss for the news. And look at that weather. I mean, honestly, it's absolutely incredible. You just need to take a look at the window for the weather forecast at the moment. Well, I have been joined in the studio by the one and only. It is Mr. Carl Fogarty, MBE, 53 years old. I'm not sure if he is quite 52 <laughs> years old. Oh, no, that's not a good start, is it? Seven times world champion and world superbike racing legend. Carl has won what? Carl or Foggy? Is it Carl or Foggy? Um, either to you, Joel. Okay, you. We'll, we'll stick with Foggy okay. for now then. Okay. Foggy has won 59 races in 12 seasons with a huge success in the Isle of Man TT, breaking the lap record at 18 minutes in a speed of 123.61 on a Yamaha 750. Also winner of the 1985 lightweight Newcomers Banks Grand Prix and went on to win three TT races. Welcome back to the Isle of Man. Thank you. It's good to be back. Always good to be back. Uh, missed a few years, so um, yeah, it's one of them kind of special kind of places that are really, it means a lot to me, it always has done, I've, all my childhood memories are really at the Isle of Man, you know, um, just follow my dad racing, that kind of thing, uh, always wanted to win the TT, then obviously move on to, to bigger things like the World Championships, you know, but um, a very emotional place to me, a very spiritual kind of place in the TT, when you land here and get the sort of goosebumps on the arms and the back of the neck and you cross Ferry Bridge and say hello to the to fairies and um, yeah it is a, it's, it's a lovely place I really love it and uh, I miss a couple of years but it's good to be back again yeah. You were over in 2007 weren't you for the century anniversary of the TT and I <coughs> read in your book actually we're going to talk a little bit later about your book in, on the uh, show and you said how much it does really bring some great memories back and also the conversations in your head perhaps about mm. whether you would compete again in the TT but even at the classic TT. Yeah like you say I came back in 07 for the millennium they got Got every kind of famous rider from all around the world, like Valentino Rossi, everyone was here, Agassini and Phil Reed. And I did that, and it, the last time I came to Alman was when, when I did you know, that race of the year, race of the century, as they call it, with Steve Isop in 92. So that was my, my goodbye to the TT, was then in 92, really. So I, I'd not been back uh, since I came back in 07, so, which is crazy, really. I don't, I don't know why that was. And when I did come back in 07, I thought, oh my God, I, I have missed this place so much. I have no idea. I cannot believe I've not been back in all those years. and doing the parade and leading it off and stuff and it just brought it all back to me all my childhood memories and memories of, of you know of racing around here some epic battles with with Steve trying to win the races and the lap record and, I, and ever since then I've always tried to get back it, it means that much to me but it's a one race I look forward to um, it's the only race I look forward to if I'm honest um, in the year um, don't bother about the short circuits too much I don't really look forward to them but the one event that I do and the one place I love to come to is, uh, is the Isle of Man and uh, thankfully I've met it over this year after a very very busy March, April and May I'm here <laughs> It is great to have you here and I remember seeing you a couple of years ago as you said when you were over and you had your, your mates as well and you had such <coughs> a great time yeah, You know what it's something I kept saying that one of these years I'm going to do this and in 2015 it was a busy year again I've, I've just done a, a TV show which everybody kind of remembers, remembers me from now and, and won that so it, it made me really really busy in, in a good way you know, and I just said, Look, I want a week off. I booked, I booked this house, uh, just coming out of Mill Town, the TC circuit. All my mates, I want all my mates to come out and just said to the manager, Look, keep that clear that 10 days. And uh, I had the best sort of seven, eight, ten days ever. You know, I had them all coming out on a rotation system three or four mates in, three or four days, three or four mates out, then three or four mates coming in. And by the end of the week, I was absolutely knackered to be honest because, uh, like, most of them like a drink and uh, got the barbecue going. And uh, obviously, the, the racing was great, the weather was great as well. And I think by the Thursday, Friday, I did some live TV stuff. I think it was must have been the Friday for the senior. Everyone said, You look knackered, you look absolutely and sounded <laughs> terrible. But it's after a week of drinking beer and uh, and just chilling out and partying with, you know, one of my mates and just watching the racing. And uh, a lot of them hadn't even been before and they just loved it. Absolutely fantastic week it was. And I need to do that again. What about your neighbour getting lost? That was funny, that. He, got, he twice got, if I ever mention that in the book actually, he twice got brought back uh, by the police <laughs> in a nice way, you know, because um, they recognised him early on the night of being with me. Uh, and I went home, I had enough, because he was, they come out at the end of the week, and I had enough by the end of the week, I can't, I can't, I can't drink anyway, two or three pints, I'm, I'm pissed, I'm oh, sorry, I'm drunk anyway, <laughs> so, um, he, he kind of got lost, and the policeman recognised and said, look, you're with Foggy, aren't they? He went, yeah, uh, but I don't know where it worked, which house I'm living at, <laughs> so, <laughs> get in here some, we know where he's staying, so, um, I think they brought him back, and he got a bit fed up, and, and bored, and went back out again, and got drunk, uh, having a few drinks, and, um, got lost again and then got brought by the, back by the same policeman so it was um it's very funny yeah but that was my neighbor he was, uh, he was, he was, a, he was a certain character he is it's quite handy being famous at times like that really isn't it i guess it was for him <laughs> otherwise he could have been sleeping uh, i don't know under a hedge all night but uh it was all right it was it was all good fun but that's what this place is like you know the 
it's um, the police, police, everybody. It's just like a community spirit, a feel, family feel to it all, and everybody kind of helps everybody, even if they're a little bit drunk and a little bit lost. <laughs> it has been a great atmosphere um, here at the Isle of Man TT. We are live on Manx Radio TT Facebook page with Foggy, Carl Fogarty MBE, so do make sure that you leave any questions that you'd like me to get answered by Foggy. We'll go to a break after this and you'll be able to get those questions answered. So let's go back to your career now. People will perhaps want to talk about your racing career and uh, within World Superbikes we'll look at first. 1991, Race for Honda finished seventh over Overall. Had a tricky year, I believe, in '92. Uh, well, '91 was tricky in some ways. We were on a really uncompetitive bike then. The RC30 was probably three or four years past, well, two or three years past its sell by date. It was a bike that came out in '88, so I was up against factory Ducatis, Kawasaki's, and Yamahas. And really, I, I only had one guy I could gauge myself off, and that was a two town world champion called Fred Merkel, who was on the same bike. So I actually beat Fred in the championship. Um, but I was only 7th or 8th in the championship, you know, it was a difficult year on a, on a very uncompetitive bike and nobody really wanted to know for, for the 92 really, so, which annoyed me because I, I knew I could beat these guys given the right kind of machinery, you know, but when you've only got your know, 8th and 9th to show for in the championship and even when I came back to Britain I was struggling with the crazy rules that there, was, that there were in Britain back then with everybody running all sorts of bikes, the, you know, the RC30 was, was really struggling and I was on it and that was a bit of an unfortunate year really. Um, so in 92, I, I kind of had to go and spend my own money that I'd made, I guess, from, from racing with Honda for two or three years in, in Britain, TT and that kind of stuff, from the World Super Bikes, um, and buy my own Ducati, which was the best bike you could probably buy and go racing with as a privateer, and won the second race. And everybody went, wow, and even myself a little bit was shocked. So um, I think it's the only time it's ever been done, and even since then it's never been done, that a privateer went and bought a bike and won a World Championship race. Um, and then that got everybody sort of standing up and taking notice of me for the rest of the year. And obviously I did really well. I was regular thorn in the, thorn in the backside of all the factory guys um, that year, and, and then obviously signed the factory contract with Ducati in '93. I mean, it was, it was a funny year in '92 because I was I was, I was racing World Superbike. I did the TT, so I was like, you know, almost won the TT race, set a new like, record, and then the week after I won a World Superbike race. So, which again, something you'll probably never see see happen again, really, in uh, in racing. A lot of privateers at the Isle of Man TT. I know will have a huge respect for you for what you did there for winning the race as a privateer, as you said, and uh, there's a lot of money that does go into it. 93, you had a battle with Scott Russell for the title. Just tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it was my first year as a factory rider. Um, I was probably under pressure a little bit, I put myself under a bit of pressure. And I was fast that year, I was very, very fast, but I was inconsistent. I crashed quite a few times and handed in the championship, really, but it started off this relationship, I guess. It's two riders who really wanted to win and like two boxers building it up for a fight who hated each other. Um, yeah, it was um, in Subag, we're just taking off, going, going through a new era really, golden era as they call it now, I guess, when Sky TV got hold of it and uh, yeah, they were doing adverts with us and all sorts and the season was, you know, really fast and competitive, um, but like I said, I won about 11, 12 races that year, I think Scott won four and he won the championship by about 27 points, I, I lost because I was, if I didn't win, I crashed sort of thing, so I was, yeah, I was a little bit, you know, a bit young in the head, I guess, in some ways, a bit too excitable and trying to trying to win, and I didn't quite win the championship, and I should have done, really. You just answered my question, I think, because one of the questions I wanted to ask you was how would you describe yourself as perhaps a racer in your younger years then? Just somebody who rolled with his heart, really, not with his head, to be honest. Um, that was the thing I should have, you know, consistency wins your championships. Um, I learned that the year after, obviously, that's... You know the mistakes I made in '93. I did learn from them and, and, and put it right in '94. I was again I was fast in '94, but you know if I did, if I couldn't win the race, I'd, I'd back up with a second or a third. A bit like you see Jonathan Ray doing these days, or, or myself in '99. But you know um, to win championships, you got to finish the races. So um, that's what I learned from '93, just to stay on the bike and pick up seconds and thirds when I can't win. And the world championship was mine. You mentioned in '94 there that you did win the title. You also won it with a broken wrist. Yeah, it was one of the seasons again, um, you know, I, I won the first round at Donington on a brand new bike, which again I was a little bit shocked, off, shocked about because the bike didn't really suit my style at, at that point. And then the second round, I, I fired myself off the thing and brought my wrist in Hockenheim, so I had to miss that, that weekend of racing. And there was a three week gap and it just about got me on the bike and a race, a race with a cast on um, for the second round. And I, I did pick up some points, although the, the, the gearbox went in the first race because I couldn't change clutch properly. Uh, change gear properly, sorry. Um, but then I used a spur back in the second race and finished fifth. So, but yeah, I to, you know, you get these things thrown at you. You know, luckily, some of the guys were inconsistent during that year as well. But um, yeah, I, 
had a broken wrist, came back from that and went on to win the championship at the very last race at the other side of the world, which was a very, a very, very sort of relieving, very emotional at the time. Quite an incredible career you really have had because then 95 again you won the title, 96 you went back with Honda, 97 back to Ducati and the second overall, 98 won the title and 99 won the title. I mean it's absolutely incredible as a career looking back on it. What are your best memories from your days at World Superbike? I think the days when you, you, you're coming out to, to 100, well in Brands actually 125,000 whatever it was on that race day it was just ridiculous. I, you know we, even in 1995 when I you know, with, with the Sky TV thing and me winning the World Championship in 94 and drawing the curtain back in the motorhome and seeing 65,000 people <laughs> in, the, in, you know, in Brands Arch in, in, in 94, 95. It was just, that's my memories. And being able to win for all those fans, that's that was what it was all about for me. Really, if I didn't win, I, I really took it home. I always took it personally and was really, really, people around me at home got it in the neck, really, because I, I wanted to win for the fans so much. Um, it hurt, really, if I didn't win. and. But the memories are so good from winning the doubles at Donington and, and Brands Arch, and then obviously the, the great following who's have around Europe, especially Assen. That was like it was just crazy. So yeah, just winning the big races in in, in my home in my home country and uh, and Europe in like Assen and even Italy as well with the, the big Italian following I had. So it was, it was great, great days. And then 2000, you retired from racing. You did have a racing incident um, at Phillip Island, and you suffered multiple injuries, didn't you? Yeah, it was a shame in some ways. It's not the way I wanted to go out. I, I don't know how many more years I would have carried on for, but um, to have an injury that forces you to retire, you don't really have a choice about it. So I, I was, I was okay about it at the time. I was, I was, you know, I was. In some ways, I felt relieved that that pressure, that expectation had gone. You know, everybody, you know, everyone who wanted, expected me to win, I expected to win, and to have, have, the, have that pressure of it not being there anymore and retire from racing. I was kind of relieved for the first year or so, I think. I didn't really miss it at all. I was kind of glad it was all over in some ways. I didn't have to go out and, and try and win again and put all that pressure on myself, you know. And it was just everybody else was kind of upset about it, really. But then as the years went on, after a year or two, I thought, God, I really miss it now, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, my injuries are, are okay now. You know, I couldn't get back on Subar. I can ride around Donington Park after five laps of being agony. But um, for doing most things in life, I'm fine, you know. I presume Michaela was quite happy when you decided also to retire, and Michaela being your wife. Yeah, I'm sure she was, really, yeah, deep down. I can't remember now, to be fair, but um, yeah, I think for her travelling around, again, it's a lot of pressure on them, a lot of stress on them from, um, you know, the, the good times you have and the bad times you have, really. So travelling around the world for 15 years doing that, um, yeah, I'm sure she was glad it was it was all over. And obviously she was here when I was doing the TT and stuff, so that was a lot of, you know, a nerve, sort of biting fingernails and nerves for her, really. So, um, but yeah, I'm sure she was quite pleased in some ways. We have got so much to talk to, about, to you about, and already we're running out of time because I wanted to talk to you about managing a team and That's so boring. much more. <laughs> but I just said, no, we're not talking about that. That's, That's boring. boring. <laughs> um, but also the fact that you're a patron of the local charity, Northwest um, Blood Bikes, and also you're the ambassador for Bike Sure Insurance as well. Yeah, I've mean, been involved with Bike Sure for a few years. Um, and it's funny enough, I just I've just actually received an award from the NSPCC as well. I, I went down to London on uh, Thursday, and I, I, I just invited because I'm like an ambassador for NSPCC. I've done a lot of charity work for them in the last 15 years, and um, I just got um, awarded the Volunteer uh, of the Year um, at the Childhood Awards on Thursday. That was a big shock to me. I was a bit, I felt a bit humbled by it all a bit. You know, sometimes I feel a bit embarrassed. I do, you don't do enough, but obviously someone, someone, someone somewhere thinks I'm doing quite, quite a lot. And uh, so I received an award from a, a Royal Highness, the, 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 the Duchess of Sussex, I think it is. I don't know. You <laughs> Should know. Yeah. So I've done, yeah, I do quite a bit uh, when I can. I'm doing that actually. I'm doing a walk across Patagonia uh, for, in, in November for the NSPCC. So. Uh, I try and you know, do my lots bit. of people wouldn't know this about no. you, Foggy, would they? Because I mean, it's not like you're quite social media heavy, and you are being quite humble. So I mean, it's great to have you here to be able to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Where's my halo? Just put <laughs> <back> on, <yeah. laughs> okay. Well, shortly we're going to take a break, and we're going to be bringing you up to date with what Foggy has been doing the last couple of years, and also because he is here to talk about his new book, The World According to Foggy. 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 <laughs> not <laughs> Foggy. So we are going to be talking about that after the break. Keep your comments coming in on Manx Radio TT Facebook page. We'll be back with you just after the break.